Good afternoon. Oh my goodness, wow. I have been getting the most exciting reports about everything that uh, you're doing. I hope you're finding this experience to be uh, a particularly good one for you personally. Um, how many of you have had a conversation in the last 24 hours that made you think about something differently? Something that gave you a different perspective or viewpoint? Anybody meet anybody new that you think you're going to be friends with and uh, follow up with? Uh, how many new ideas to change the world? I mean, I, I hope there's a whole bunch of them out there. Well, now we're going to focus on an issue that cuts across all of that and which is about as relevant as it can be to everything that we're doing here at CGIU, and that is higher education. Uh, we have a panel of terrific experts with a diverse set of experiences and perspectives. Uh, we have uh, a panelist uh, from right here at uh, Arizona State University. We have a superintendent of schools. We have a founder and director of a school uh, in India. We have an author and an activist. We have a president and CEO of, a, of the MasterCard Foundation. We have a, a good cross-section of people whose experience and perspectives I think you will find particularly relevant. They will explore the challenges of increasing access to education um, in our rapidly changing world at a time when it's never been more important. Uh, it's such a truism, you hear it all the time, but I think probably because it is true that around the globe, education still remains the key uh, to unlocking opportunity for individuals, for families, communities, and even countries. It remains the route out of poverty and into a better life with a rising income. It is the key to whether or not girls and women will have the chance to occupy their rightful places and assume responsibilities uh, in their societies. And of course, it raises all of the classic values issues about how we promote uh, democracy and free expression while being respectful of people's historical and cultural beliefs. Now, there are huge barriers to access. Some are financial, some indeed are cultural, political, logistical. So we need to think through how to answer those questions uh, based on what are the realities that a young person in the United States faces versus a young person in Tanzania or a young person in Bangladesh and all the way around the world. And of course, here in the United States, we are struck by some quite unfortunate realities. There are six million young people in this country between the ages of 16 and 24 who are neither employed nor in school. And even for a young person with a college degree, it's difficult to find a good job. The Unemployment rate for young college graduates is over 8%. That's about a point and a half higher than the national average for all workers. But if you're looking for a job without a high school degree, it gets so much harder. The unemployment rate there soars to 26%. One in four young people who drop out of high school end up out of work, some of them for many years. Now think about what that means. It, it's not just about missing a paycheck, as important as that is, or going without uh, benefits, that's important too, but you're missing out on a crucial period of personal and professional growth that can set you on your life course. First jobs are when people gain skills, find networks, build confidence, internalize lessons about work. My very first job, other than babysitting, was a kind of, oh, um, exaggerated form of babysitting. I was 13, and I got a job as a supervisor of a park. Uh, three hours in the morning, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. 
I was thrilled. I felt so excited to have this job. Now, the problem was the park was about, oh, I think four miles from where I lived, and we only had one car, and my father took that to work. So that meant I had to figure out how to get my equipment, which was things like games and a volleyball and stuff, from my house to the school where the park was. That was my first logistical challenge. And it wasn't easy because I couldn't figure out how to get it all on my bike. So I ended up a 13-year-old girl pulling a wagon and just prayed nobody I knew would ever see me as I was <laughs> going by their homes. But I learned a lot. I learned a lot from that first job all the way to my last job. So I recognize the importance of helping young people get those opportunities to learn not only skills, but also more about themselves. Now, economists say that the youth unemployment crisis could cost just our own country more than $20 billion in lost earnings over the next decade. But I've also seen, especially in the last four years as Secretary of State, how many places around the world are not able to provide enough jobs for young people who end up feeling alienated and marginalized, who can't figure out how to participate. It's corrosive and, in some instances, even explosive. So what are we going to do about it? That's what the panel will address. How do we design a higher education system for the 21st century? building on what works, like the very creative re-engineering of a major university that has gone on right here at ASU? How do we say that a four-year college is not the right path for everyone? And in fact, there are lots of important jobs to be done that may not require a college degree, but require respect for the dignity of the work that is being done. How do we support our community colleges? And, and get back to really respecting vocational and technical work. I don't know how we would operate uh, without people who are acquiring those skills and putting them to work for all of us. So getting the right skills is more important than ever, but making sure that there is a connection between getting those skills and then having jobs where you can use them. I'm delighted that we're beginning to have this conversation in our country, and it has to be a partnership, a partnership, of course, between government at all levels, between the private sector, between academia at all levels, and the not-for-profit sector. There's one example that I want to leave with you, and last year at CGIU, a student from Babson College <laughs> named Daquan Oliver committed to start an entrepreneurship training program for underserved middle and high school aged kids in Massachusetts. He went home, he started working on a curriculum, raising money, looking for private sector partners. A year later, he's hired three staff. They're holding training sessions at an NGO in South Boston. The young people who participate build and run simulation businesses. They also learn workplace skills like time management, teamwork, planning, public speaking, and critical thinking. That's the kind of initiative we hope to spur here this year as well. Somebody said something really interesting to me last night with one of the descriptions of the programs that have been started by CGIU participants in years past, that this one uh, project affected 60 families. And the person said, you know, when I heard that, I thought, well, that's not a lot. And then I thought, but it is for those 60 families. And then what they do to reach out to more people and to claim a future that is better for themselves. At the Clinton Foundation, that's what Bill and Chelsea and I are trying to do, which is encourage people to take these kinds of initiatives and to participate, as we talked about yesterday. 
So I'm looking forward to hearing from our panelists, and even more, I'm looking forward to following what each and every one of you um, do and think about when it comes to participating as uh, we open more doors and more eyes uh, to what millennial uh, generation young people uh, are going to be contributing. So let's bring on the panel and let's make sure that we turn good intentions into good outcomes. Thank you all very much. Thank you all. Uh, it is such an honor to be here with this fine, distinguished panelist, which we have agreed is uh, diverse both in experience, uh, perspective, uh, geography around the world, and our, uh, one of our panelists pointed out in age. So I thought that was fine. Thank you. I wanted to remind everyone today that if you have a smartphone or tablet or laptop or other device, please feel free to join us in participating in today's event at www.bing.com slash CGIU. Uh, so to get started, I have asked the panelists if they would each take a brief minute to introduce themselves. And in particular, I'd like to ask them to tell us what drives them and that they're most passionate about and what brings them here in terms of talking about uh, disrupting higher education and being a change agent in higher education. So I'm going to start with you, Nikhil. Well, thanks so much for having me today. Uh, my name is Nikhil Goyle. I'm 18 years old, um, and I'm not in college at the moment. Um, but my background is, a few years ago, I wrote a book on education reform. And now I'm working on looking at successful and alternative models of schooling uh, around the world. And my main premise is that the real world should be the, the, the best classroom that any young person can really be in. And so for the past few years, I've been self-directing my learning by curating my own learning experiences through books, lectures, conferences, traveling, and just exploring the world. And I think uh, what I've learned over the past few years is that living and learning really should be inseparable. They should be indistinguishable. That we should be letting young people use public spaces in our communities and our cities, like libraries, maker spaces, uh, athletic facilities, and community centers for learning, problem solving, and collaboration. Um, so I'm really excited about this, this conversation about the future of higher education and what that means for young people today. Because as we've seen, we have uh, tens of, young people are saddled with tens of thousands of dollars in student loan debt. Uh, 50, around 53% of recent college graduates are underemployed or unemployed. And so there brings the question is, what's the value of a college degree? And what are some alternatives to the current education system that we have today? So I'm really interested in exploring that um, as we go on. Rita, if you'd please tell us what drives you and what brought you here. And we are so pleased to have you as a partner at Arizona State University. So please tell us what brought you here and what inspires you to do the work you do. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, I have to say that the person who inspired me the most was my mother because uh, I grew up in Malaysia. Uh, she made enormous sacrifices after my father died uh, to ensure that I got an education. So my first scholarship was my mother's scholarship. And after that, it was a series of scholarships which enabled me to complete my education. So I am passionate about education being part of the tra changing the trajectory of my life. And now that um, I'm in a position to lead a foundation uh, which seeks to do something powerful in this world, particularly in Africa, education is such uh, it's a it's a powerful vehicle. But not necessarily education to take what Nikhil said a moment ago, as it is defined today that education which is driven by what the learner needs to acquire, about equipping the learner, he or she is prepared for a lifetime journey of learning. Learning, but also with purpose. Learning to contribute and learning to make a difference in people's lives. Not just for our own individual satisfaction, but really for contribution so others can benefit, so that we can make the world much, much more equitable, a gentler world perhaps, but most important, a world where everyone, everybody, regardless of circumstances, has an opportunity to really fulfill the promise that's in them. Thank you. Thank you. Austin, who hails from the great state of North Carolina, uh, tell us a bit about what you're passionate about and what drove you to build the really innovative programs that you're leading and what inspires you? 
Thank you very much. I, I really want to first of all thank the CGIU and the Clinton Foundation for their sacrifices uh, and the leadership. My mother, I grew up in a very, very poor county, a very poor village, and that uh, was seeing the pain and the struggle my family was going through, I was determined that limitations was not going to stop me from doing anything. And if I can get education, every single child born on earth should be able to get the same kind of education, if not better. Thank you. And last, and certainly not least for our opening remarks, Bunker, please share with us some of the great insight and experiences that you've gained over the years at Barefoot College. There's a saying by Mark Twain which says, never let school interfere with your education. Yeah. <laughs> school is where you learn how to read and write, and education is what you get from your family, from your environment, and from your community. So I wanted to start a college which had no walls, no professors, no degrees, no classrooms, but it had to be a college where the teacher was the learner and the learner was the teacher. And it had to be a college which was giving dignity to working with your hands, working the skills and knowledge of very poor communities all over the world, have tremendous knowledge and skills, and we wanted to have a college where you could identify that skill, respect that skill, and apply that skill. So 40 years ago, we started this college, and my passion is to see a non-person becoming a human being. Someone who had nothing, came from the most inaccessible, most remote villages of the world, and in six months, the college could make them into decent, responsible, gutsy, individuals who would want to change the village when they came, where they came from. So the college has now spread to 64 countries around the world, and we have only trained grandmothers. Not because we came to the conclusion 40 years ago that men are untrainable. <laughs> men are restless, men are compulsively mobile, Men are ambitious, and they all want a certificate. And the moment you give a man a certificate anywhere in the world, he leaves the village looking for a job in a city. So why don't you change, only train people who are living and rooted in the soil? And so grandmothers are the solutions to that. That fantastic point. I, that's a, I love that. And I want to come back to something that, and again, I want to encourage you to vote uh, about every five seconds. It's at pulse.com, CGIU. Uh, what is, there's clear agreement on the value of education, and several of you spoke on that, so I want to come back to that. Uh, Austin, you are superintendent of a district that is one of two in the nation that has an early college model for every high school. I'd like you to share a few thoughts on, explain this issue we talked briefly a bit about backstage, the value of a credential versus the value of an education and how that fits with the model that you're leading in Dublin County. Um, the community is, is all about partnership, like we say, and raising the expectations. And I heard Secretary Clinton also saying earlier that uh, this key force that the preparation nowadays, a high school diploma is, is almost going to put you on the waiting list for McDonald's job. So I'm looking at the community we come from, about two-thirds of the entire adult population do not have either a high school diploma or a college credential. So we were determined as a community to change that, to, to, to bring prosperity, and we believe doing that is through education. And we came in and look at the statistics. I think right now it says about six out of every 10 jobs in 2020 is going to require preparation beyond high school. So it was then become our responsibility to add value to what our kids get. 
not just graduating, but find relevance, relevance so that they can participate in an economic and global world. So we feel a sense of responsibility and, of course, a sense of urgency to prepare every child for the workforce. And that's a great model, and, I, and I'd like to now flip to the other side of it, Nikhil. You said in your opening remarks that you're not in college right now, and yet you're educating yourself. And so I know you're passionate about alternative models. So tell us a little bit about where, where, that, where you see that as a need for change in schools today, whether you're thinking high schools or college, if that's in your plan for the future. Right. So I think a lot of high school kids today are unfortunately under the, um, the philosophy of herd mentality, where every, every kid in your school, almost every kid, wants to go to college or they're planning to go to college, and therefore you have to go to college. I think very few people are actually asking themselves the question, should I go to college? And if I'm going to college, why am I going to college? And I think that those two questions rarely cross the minds of young people. Um, and what I would argue is that um, the, what the, the way the world is changing today, the value of the college degree is plummeting. Um, we're seeing that people who are in technical and especially technology backgrounds, um, it actually might you do a disservice if you have a degree rather than having a GitHub account or a portfolio. So more employers are starting to realize that just because you went to Harvard or just because you went to a prestigious university, that doesn't mean you can actually accomplish, be competent, and actually solve problems. And so there are a lot of alternatives within the higher education sphere um, uh, Place, uh, programs like the Teal Fellowship, which is a two-year, 20 under 20 program, which gives young people $100,000 to start their own company or organization, but the catch is they have to leave school for two years. There's a program called Institute, which is a two-year apprenticeship program, and I love the idea of bringing back apprenticeships because that's one thing that's been lost in the soul of American society today. There's places like Watson University where you can take a semester off and work on some kind of entrepreneurial problem that you're really interested in. So young people are starting to realize that I don't necessarily have to go through the four-year degree. I, there's more opportunities out there uh, for you to succeed, and I think more people are taking the advantage of that. So that's interesting, and, and actually I would say everyone on the stage is an entrepreneur in education. And so, Rita, I wanted to, you know, going from that and thinking about the idea that education is driven by what the learner needs to acquire, how then, from your perspective, and you think about what the MasterCard Foundation Scholars Program is doing, how, how does, I know MasterCard's very committed to financial literacy, and you're thinking about how that helps facilitate and drive change. Tell us a little bit about the importance of the financial literacy piece from your perspective and your experience, and what that's taught you as you've been working through the Scholars Program. Okay, thank you for that question. I do want to say that we work across a spectrum, uh, in a spectrum of young people at different life stages. So we work in the formal education uh, arena, as exemplified by the MasterCard Foundation scholars, several of whom are here, uh, particularly from ASU, from Berkeley, uh, from Westminster University. But we also work with young people who will, because of circumstances, not, not of their own doing, but circumstances who will never have an opportunity to go to school. But that doesn't mean that they shouldn't have an opportunity to learn and acquire skills which they, they can, where they can improve their lives, they can make a livelihood, and they can go on to do other things. So there, there's a range. Financial literacy has come into that play. We work a lot with young people in uh, rural areas in Africa, in Ghana, in Malawi, in, in Kenya, where there are very, very few options in terms of um, even access, basic access to finance, access to savings, let alone access to jobs. And so we work with very inventive organizations who are looking to completely radically revolutionize what, what learning and what an education is all about. It begins most profoundly by asking people, what are you interested in? What gets you excited? Not what someone tells you what you should do with your life. And if you're a girl, that you should get married before you're 15, have your first child by the time you're 16. But really to help them articulate what are options for them. So in northern Ghana, for example, we work with an organization called CAMFED, uh, which stands for the Campaign for Female Education. 
And I'm sure my colleagues here know that if you invest in a girl's education, you can change the trajectory of her lifetime income easily between 15 to 25% over her lifetime. That's significant because we also know that women invest, to take your point, Bunker, 90% of what they earn in their families compared to a man who invests maybe about 35% of their income in their families. That has profound implications for the health, for the well-being, and the betterment of the, not only the family, but the community. Financial literacy comes into play. I hear all the time from young people, from grandmothers, I wish I had known, someone had told me something about how I differentiate my needs and my wants, how I make a budget, how I prepare a plan. And so a considerable amount of our resources goes into educating and providing financial literacy access, not in a classroom, but it could be in a field, it could be in, in the coffee plantation. It's about where people are. And it's providing them not only just access to concepts, but access to the ability to actually save. And someone, this is another myth. People often ask me, my family, when they hear things that I'm doing, do poor people actually have money to save? And the answer is yes. They do. They do have money. But the crazy thing about it is they have no formal means to save that money in a secure, private, accessible, and affordable place. And, that's, um, and that sets them back economically. But they do have funds. They save in things which uh, we may not recognize to be savings. They save in goats. They save in chickens. But the problem is when you have an emergency, you can't sell half your goat. You have to liquidate everything that you, you have, and it sets you back. And so access to both not only financial literacy and the know-how, but the means to save is also incredibly powerful. Thank you. And taking from that and thinking about inventive models, Bunker, I'd like to go back to something that you said, uh, which is that the teacher is the learner and the learner is the teacher. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that means in terms of how Barefoot College operates and what's different about it? For all the young people sitting here who want to do development work abroad, this is a message. Never call anybody who doesn't know how to read and write uneducated. You know, we have a tendency of saying, oh, but this man is uneducated. Actually, what you're trying to say is that he is illiterate or she is illiterate. But never, because these people are the ones we have learned from. My real education started when I met these extraordinary people who didn't know how to read and write, but had such tremendous wisdom, compassion, patience, passion. This is what really makes the world go around. Now, you must remember. Where is it written that just because you can't read and write, you can't become an architect, you can't become an engineer, you can't become a communicator? You, where is it written? This is a mental block we must get rid of, must get over. Because this is, you'll find them everywhere. So today, there are grandmothers we are teaching only through sign language, only through sign language, not the written or spoken word. And within six months, these women become solar engineers. Can you imagine these gutsy grandmothers becoming solar engineers by sign language? It's extraordinary. So please, this is where we have to have redefined education. What do we mean by education today in the third and fourth world? Where lots of people cannot go to school and college, and yet they have so much to contribute, so much to give. The only thing is that we have to have the tools, the patience, the humility to be able to learn from them. And this is the only message I can give to the young people around here who want to go to do work in the villages today. So. I love this idea of redefining education and what it means because depending on where you're working and which organization you're working with uh, and everyone here in the room, that can mean different things. So I'd, I'd love to get thoughts on, based on what you're doing and what change you're trying to drive, what does it mean? So how about a specific example of if you could redefine education and change it, what would be the, let's name the one or two things that you think would be really critical? We'll start, Nikhil. 
Well, I would start by turning the city and the community into the school itself. Um, because if you imagine, uh, because right now what we have today in our society, you have from the time you go to school until the time you graduate, that's called some, some kind of education. And after that, you go to college, and that's it. Um, I believe that learning should be lifelong. It should be throughout your entire uh, time on this planet. And imagine if you turn all these amazing spaces ar around the community into places where people can congregate and collaborate and, and work on things. Um, I mean, there's, there's some extraordinary examples um, where, for example, there's one school in, in uh, Massachusetts called Sudbury Valley, where this is a K-12 school, but they don't actually call it K-12 because there aren't grade levels. In this school, kids can learn whatever they want they don't have grades, they don't have tests, no required classes. They have democratic process, so students can, they vote on school policies. Um, they also have a constitution, so if a student breaks a rule, they go to trial with the jury of their peers and a staff member. What we found is that when children get freedom over their learning, when there's no coercion, when they learn based on their interests and their own intrinsic motivation, then you get truly passionate, creative, and curious people, um, and a society that's much more equitable, passionate, um, and, and self-educated. Because I think we need to have a, a population in a world that is self-educated and understands uh, what it means to be a natural learner. Okay, so different spaces, different definitions, and lack of coercion and self-direction, some key things. Rita, from you, key things you would change about redefining. So ditto. <laughs> on that. I think there's a couple, two or three things I'd really want to be able to see, whether it's formal education or non-formal education. Number one, it's getting more girls and removing the barriers to get girls into education, without question. That's, um, that's key. Second, I think uh, the learning environment, uh, whether it's, in a, again, in a classroom or if it's not in a classroom, needs to be relevant to what that young person needs to acquire. And it is, and today, relevance is not just about communication skills. Yes, it's about um, you know, digital technology. But really, relevance is about problem solving. And it's about creating an open mind. It's about liberating your brain from what you may have been taught or from customs, which, uh, which may have been conventional norms in society. But it's really be, being able to see and understand and draw your own conclusions. It's about confronting situations, people, cultures which it may seem so different, so radically different from what you have ever known, and understanding that this is what this is the world and this is how we need to live. So an education which enables someone to just not only cross mental boundaries, but clearly cultural boundaries, emotional boundaries, that that to me is part of an enriched education which becomes a passport for life. Thank you. Austin. I also detail <laughs> um, increasingly, what, 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 I, what I like to, what I would like to see education will look, will look like a restaurant where you go into a restaurant, you look at the menu, and each customer is allowed to choose whatever they want to eat, and then take it back to the kitchen and let them prepare it according to your request. So that goes back. So every child schools education should be flexible enough where every single child's dream and talent can be developed and be able to be successful in any economic world. Uh, that's one thing which would require some mindset change. And the other thing is we need to accept a child uniqueness because until education or the education environment continue to accept the uniqueness, the, the differences that every child brings, that see the differences as talent, as contribution to our society, then those autonomy and those values that uh, Nikhil talked about will be better utilized if we can do that. And also restore respect back to the profession of education. We must respect. Uh. Yes, and that's a great point. And so I, I love the idea of personalization, and uh, and I'll come back to the issue of the role of the teacher because that's something that many of you have talked about, and I want to come to that. Bunker, key things that you think we need to do to redefine education. What would they be? 
more than 50% of children in India don't go to, in the rural areas don't go to school. So we found an innovative way of looking at education outside the box. We started schools at night for these children, the shepherd boys and girls who never go to school in the morning, but we started a school at night for children to learn more about their village, about their community, about their indigenous institutions. And we are running about 150 night schools for 7,000 children. But the, the innovation in this is that every three years, these 7,000 children between 6 and 14 elect a prime minister. The prime minister is 12 years old. She looks after 20 goats in the morning, but she's prime minister in the evening. She has a cabinet between 6 and 14 years old who man monitors and supervises and administers the schools. And she is very powerful. If she should happen to write a postcard to me saying this teacher is misbehaving, she's not coming in time, misbehaving with the solar lantern, not using the teaching aids, he or she is fired. So it's a very serious thing for a prime minister who's 12 years old to write to me about a teacher. Five years ago, she went to get the world's children's prize from the Queen of Sweden. And she walked into Sweden as if she's been there all her life, never been outside of <laughs> village in her life. And the Queen of Sweden turned to me and said, can you ask this 12-year-old girl where she got her confidence from? You know, she's never been. So I asked her, I said, where do you get your confidence from? So this 12-year-old girl looked at the Queen straight in the eye and said, please tell her I'm the Prime Minister. <laughs> okay, remember, remember to weigh in at bing.com, CGIU. So I, I, want to, I want to pick up on this a bit in terms of uh, the value of education. The audience is split on uh, the poll about the quality of higher education today. Uh, but I, I want to think about, when we think about what education does for a person and the value of education, this idea of instilling confidence and inspiring young people and the role of the educators in that and the role of the individual in that. I think these are really important issues and topics in terms of the areas in which you're each working. So instilling confidence and inspiring students. So I want to start, Rita, with you because I know something that, your, that MasterCard is very focused on is youth entrepreneurship. And part of that being, again, regardless of formal or informal education, but it being about the self-confidence and, uh, and especially of young women because of the difference that they make in their communities. So can you talk a little bit about uh, this, uh, this need for inspiring that confidence that Bunker talked about? I think it's absolutely essential. Uh, without confidence, you can't take the step, first step forward and realize who you could be and what you could do. Um, we work with a number of organizations, and again, I'm not going to distinguish whether it's formal or informal, to find ways, and a lot of the work that we do is delivered through young people themselves, delivered through young people to their peers. And so they are peer educators. Uh, and I think of projects in Kenya and in Uganda where young people who've been, who go through a particular curricula work with a set of their peers and take them through a process, a process of self-discovery, of asking them to think for the first time, what, are you, what do you really like? What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? to provide them with some very, very basic market research skills, to think about what might be livelihood opportunities within their community. Are there unmet needs where they could actually create an idea which would generate income, as well as provide a service for their community? You go down a little bit further, uh, they then either in groups or on their own actually develop that idea. We provide them with access to mentors and then comes access to finance. And so that journey is also a journey of self-discovery. Now the one big difference between certainly life in the United States, life uh, in, in many in North America versus life in many parts of the villages and the communities that I've been, there are no safety nets. In Silicon Valley, it's a badge of courage to start up 15 different things, to be a serial entrepreneur and to fail. You have that opportunity to fail. For many of these young people, there is enormous pressure. When I have posed the question, what would you prefer to do? 
oh, I'd prefer to get a job. Why? Because that's safety, that's predictability. It may not be a job I want or I like or I'm even, even interested in, but it, it is a means to fulfill a responsibility, a financial economic responsibility. So the journey of entrepreneurship is a solo journey for many, many young people who we work with. And that means the incredible importance of creating a network, so support networks, uh, others who are part of their community to help them succeed. Um, but then I'll stop there. Thank you. And so I want to I want to go from that though to then turn back to Austin something that you raised, which is the role of the teacher and thinking of teachers as uh, even nation builders, if you will, as a comment that you have made previously. And so tell us then how do teachers play this role in inspiring confidence and resilience to the failure that Rita is talking about so that they can be successful in their own personal lives, no matter where we're talking in this country, in this world? Y yes. Um, I would say in Dublin County, for example, we're very fortunate where our teachers, all of us, came together for a renewed commitment. A very talented teacher who loved children. Uh, you must love children. And you must also respect their dreams, their destination. And once you accept that, then you will do whatever it takes to get them there. So um, the first thing I will... <laughs> The first thing I will say that as institution, what we can do as far as that is concerned is that very often we put labels on children. The motivation will come and our teachers have to change that to create environment where these students themselves, I agree with what Bunker said, the teacher is, should be the chief learner and the student should be the problem solver and the teacher and the student can interact, have the freedom, the student should have the freedom to re interact with the teacher while the teacher play a facilitating role. And I think the more we allow children to be able to think on their own and engage in that critical thinking, and it's okay to make mistakes, but these are ways you can improve on, in your mistakes. So I think that flexibility has to be there for our teachers have to understand that. And I think the other thing our teachers have to do too is every child, if every one of us in this room t this afternoon were told to depart from our destination here at, it, at the same time, some of us would be late because we are coming from different angles, different, different destinations. So we have to allow flexibility for that growth and for that development in every single child. That's a great point in terms of need for variance in the system and, and what needs to change. And, and so, Bunker, I think it's fascinating that you work with all ages and that it's around what does the community need in thinking how do we drive change. As you think about some of the learnings, you it's 40 years, is that right, for Barefoot College, 40 years. As you think about what you've learned, what do you see as next? What have I learned? Never underestimate a community to identify their own problem and identify their own solution. Never. <laughs> you don't have to go to school and college for that. There are, second, always look for solutions within. Don't look for solutions outside. There are solutions staring at you in the face that we don't have the skills to identify. Look for those solutions because that is the only sustainable solution today. Looking for the solutions and inside you. You don't need someone from the World Bank to tell you about poverty. You can see it staring at you in the face. So why don't we start rethinking about education as a tool to be able to bring about this change within ourselves first and then within ourselves outside. That this is the only way to do it. There is never an urban solution to a rural problem. There's only a rural solution to a rural problem.
education as a tool for change. That's great. So, Nikhil, I'm going to ask you to comment on um, what, when you think about your journey and what led you and what prompted you even to start in your, uh, your young life of activism as far as it's taken you thus far, uh, some of it was centered originally around educational tools and standardized testing and things of this nature. And there are lots of tools, all new available learning tools. But if we think about education as a tool for change, uh, what is a, from your perspective, what is a critical tool that we should be looking at? And contrast it, if you would, with some of the opportunity that you've seen around as you've had a chance to travel. Because there's variance in that and how education can be a tool for change. So what do you think are some key drivers of tools that we can use in education for change? Well, I think the primary one would be self-directed learning. Um, I think that self-directed learning um, is becoming, I think, the, the next, the biggest thing in education um, in the next few decades. Because what we're seeing is that young people, no matter where you live in the world, you can get an education through the internet, through books, through lectures, through conferences, what have you. And my motto really is never let, uh, don't wait for permission to do something remarkable. Don't wait for some authority or institution or some adult to tell you you can't do something. And my, what I believe is that young people really need to be in the world around them. They need to be in, in communities and environments of people who have been exploited, people who have been oppressed, people who are less privileged. I think those kinds of opportunities, trying to understand the lives of other people is what I think is going to really change education. Realizing that um, I, I, it really goes back to um, his name is um, Krishna Murthy, and what he says is that systems don't really change from the outside. It doesn't come from the periphery. It comes from when people themselves realize there's a change from within. When you realize that the revolution doesn't necessarily start with schools, it starts when you try to change your lifestyle and change your methods and your philosophies on, on different issues. And I think that's what we have to realize is that um, slowly, this system and the system of education may be on K-12 or higher education. It really is going to start when people start ask themselves, what does education look like? How can I reinvent my learning? And what does that look, what, how can we create a more equitable, democratic, and uh, peaceful, and fulfilled world where people are doing things that they truly love to do and unleashing the genius within, within each and every person? Good, thank you. Rita, I want to go back to something that you said a moment ago. The audience uh, responded very favorably in response to your comment that girls need access to education uh, globally. Uh, I want to ask what you have had the opportunity to learn in your time now that you've been leading MasterCard Foundation, and in particular with the MasterCard Foundation Scholars Program. So tell me some of the key insights that you've learned from the scholars themselves. Oh. Too many insights, uh, so, so much that I've learned. I'm so honored by the, the number of scholars that I've had an opportunity to meet. The Scholars Program, for those of you who have, may have heard a bit about it, is a movement that we are creating. Uh, it's a, a movement of eventually what will become 15,000 young people, largely for across the continent of Africa, uh, who will have an opportunity not only just to go to secondary school or, or, to, or to college or university, whether it's here at ASU or elsewhere in North America, but largely across the continent of Africa. It is more than just an education program. It is really about a leadership development program. We're looking to create 15,000 leaders, not really create, to accompany them on their leadership journey so that they become part of the change, which I think Nikhil, Bunker, Austin have been talking about. This movement, so to speak, has been breathtaking for us in terms of how it's even transforming our own thinking at the foundation. One of the biggest lessons, um, which I learned early on, but never really articulated uh, until much later, is something which Bunker said a moment ago, don't call someone who doesn't know how to read and write uneducated. And I, I, we confront the same thing when we started to create this program because we are looking for very special young people very special in the sense that these are young people who are going to come from communities which have may never have sent anyone to school, anyone through secondary age school, let alone even university. These are communities which are marginalized, uh, which have been left behind, you could say economically disadvantaged, you could say poor. And oftentimes I'm asked, do you think anyone from these communities can actually get into Arizona State University, or they could get into Stanford, or they could get into Ashesi University in Ghana? 
And the answer is yes. Economic circumstances, you know, the state of poverty, that may be an economic reality, but that is not a state of mind. That is not how they perceive themselves. They do not see themselves as poor. That just has, this reveals nothing about potential, human potential. And more importantly, the young people who we're looking for are young people who have within them, through the process, who have identified a profound commitment to actually make a difference, which is one of the reasons why we're so privileged to participate and to partner with CGI University. It's this confluence of events and the commitments. I know all of you are making commitments, but I also hope you know your commitment is not just your project. Your commitment is your lifetime, and your lifetime to think about how you're going to invest yourselves in, in actually making a difference and making the world much, a much better place. Okay, we have come to our time for closing remarks. I want to give each of our fantastic panelists time to leave us with parting thoughts to provoke thinking and to provoke action and participation. Uh, so I'd like to ask each panelist if they would take a minute to share some final thoughts for our audience today. So Austin, I'd like to start with you. <laughs> yeah, thank you again for having, having me here. I just want to say that we have to understand it's critical, very, very important. Education is very important. You don't, your, dest, your, your situation, whether you're poor, whatever, should not determine where you end up. And, and it's up to individual, the individual person to take the responsibility to, 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 to take education seriously. And we as educators, and, and I thank uh, ASU for, for the board leadership of President Kroll, what a wonderful, we need leaders like that around the world. One who knows what it takes and stands strong and do it, whatever it takes. So I, I want to encourage all the students here today, you all say believe in yourself. We talk about inspiration and motivation and confidence. Do not let no circumstances or no one take that away from you because you are born and created. You are born and created for success. So we need to take that very seriously and let's form a community of learners, a community that value learning and a community that is also willing to do whatever it takes to support one another. Uh, uh, let's start early. Let's not wait till the child gets to the ninth grade or get to the 10th grade before we talk about college. Let's de demystify college. Let's start very, very early. If you give a child a computer, an iPad right now, a four-year-old iPad, what does that child do with that iPad? It can even tell me what to do with that iPad that I cannot do. <laughs> so we need to start early. Thank you. <laughs> Nick Dill, 30 seconds. Key thoughts you want to leave with people. Well, I, I'll just end with really just a, um, an open-ended question. Um, I think it really boils down to what kind of world do we want to live in and what kind of people do we want our society, what kind of characteristics do we want people in our society to have? Do we want a, a society where people are compliant, obedient, and um, just follow directions? Or do we want a society where people are curious, happy, fulfilled, and intrinsically motivated? I think that's what it really comes down to, and that's why education is so indispensable and why it really needs to be revolutionized across the board. Thank you. Rita, quick thoughts. Okay, very quickly, we're all, we're all on a leadership journey. That's why we're here. Education is just one component of that leadership journey. I'm still on my leadership journey, and I'm theoretically working in a career. We're all lifelong learners. Part of being a leader is also taking risks, personal risks and making some sacrifices. All of you have already made, taken risks and made sacrifices, which is why you're here. So my wish for everyone, my wish for everybody here, my panelists, is that we continue to learn from each other. We continue to question our assumptions. When we think we've got it down, to ask again whether we really understand to listen, to really actively listen, to have respect. Respect for people, respect for each other, and really think about what we can do personally to make this world better. Thank you. And the final word, and some words of wisdom and insight, Bunker. We had a visit of His Holiness the Dalai Lama to the Barefoot College, 
and he had a look at what we were doing. He found we were doing everything wrong, but something was coming out right. <laughs> and he had something very profound to say. He said, now that you have shown the Barefoot College working in practice, let's see if the professors and experts can make it work in theory. <laughs> Everything we are doing wrong and something we have to be able, something is right. There is a magic there that we have to share and that's all about education. I'll end with a quotation of Mahatma Gandhi. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. For all of you out there in the audience who are trying to drive change, you all know that to be absolutely, completely true, as everyone here on the stage with me knows as well. Uh, on behalf of Arizona State University, please join me in one more round of applause for this amazing panel. I would like to please remind you uh, to ask the audience to please remain in your seats for the next part of this plenary. And thank you very much for being here with us.